This is Keep On Cooking, a podcast for people who love cookbooks and want to know more about the authors. It's also a great place to get a weekly dose of culinary inspiration to keep things pumping in the kitchen. So grab a cookbook and keep on cooking. I'm Dustin Harder, and this is Keep On Cooking. Hello, and welcome to Keep On Cooking, the only podcast dedicated to plant based cookbooks. I'm your host, Dustin Harder, and he once jumped out of a plane because I told him to. He's my husband, and he's riding passenger today with me on the pod. It's David Rossetti. It's me, and I did jump out of a plane. It's me, because Mario. You... It's the mustache, doesn't I? If I say that, doesn't the Mario vibe? The Mario vibe. Yes. Um. Yes, we did jump out of a plane. Oh, it was really you. Listen, you everybody. It. For years, I was like, David, I want to go skydiving. There was even like an almost trip that we a, a trip in San Diego where we were so heavily looking into it, and then we we were like, oh, we can't do it, money, whatever, this that thing, and then we were planning the trip to Ireland. So we actually jumped out of the plane. While we were hosting a trip to Ireland with the Vegan Travel Club, um, and the reason we did it there is because our friend Kevin Graney, we were at his house and he said to us, he was like, uh, we were talking about skydiving. He goes, well, where are you going to do it at? And we were like, I don't know, somewhere here in Georgia, there was there's a place like 60 miles away. And he goes, are you going to Ireland? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, you guys should do it there. He's like, I did it. He did it somewhere off exotic and amazing. That. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's so right. Now, listen, when you're hosting a trip of 20 people, I don't know if it's like the best idea to start off your trip this way. I we, will it was say day, was day, it two, day two. Like and we had traveled there and then we the next got morning. there a day early so that we could go do the skydiving. And our friend, Laura Van Zant. Uh, was with us and who of her rivers butcher she runs all their marketing she's fantastic Laura. amazing shout fabulous. out to laura shout out to laura um she had done it several times and she was like i will go with you so she did and um her boyfriend at the time sean as well he came with us but anyways we jumped out of and kelly from kelly's crew was with kelly's us as well was moral support uh, moral support looking at us our the whole time yeah but she was looking at us like Y'all crazy. Y'all go right on ahead. So I drove a car. We had to go rent a car and I drove on the other opposite side of the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, for them, it's the, that was an adventure. the, the correct side of the, the road, but for me, right? it was the opposite. So David, what's the, you always had to tell me at the roundabout. Um, uh, left around a roundabout. Left around the roundabout. Left around a roundabout. Um, because you want to go the other way there. Anyways, long story short, I will say this. We jumped out of a plane. Yes, I asked you to do it. You said yes. Will you ever do it again? I don't know. I can tell you straight up, I will never do it again. No, thank you. No, thank you is what I say to jumping out of a plane. I'm glad you did this, it though, right? I'm glad I did it. So part of my like reasoning behind this, and this is going to sound so crazy to everyone, but it's actually like, it's a condition. I looked it up. When I'm around high heights, when I'm around mm -hmm. heights, yep. is that high heights or is that redundant I mean, to say that? I mean, heights. I think. Yeah. When I'm at, when I'm at a high, I can't say it without saying when I'm around, when I, when you're high up, in when the I'm air, tall up in the sky, tall up in the sky, <laughs> I have this urge in me to, and everyone don't get scared. I'm very aware of what I'm saying and yep. what I'm feeling. And no, I no, purposefully no. don't go on balconies because it's of this. No, it's a thing. I have people. an urge to jump and not out of anything dark or sinister. It's like, there's this bodily urge in me mm -hmm. that's like oh i want to jump um but then i also get terrified because i'm having that thought all these things right or that thought of like what if i did jump you know like i don't have I that have, you don't have i'm that? gonna die if i jump well no no, no but like <laughs> i know the what if i have a little bit of that like just that desire to jump do you but not like in a like I want to end it all kind of way or, no no you know, no that's that not yeah, that's yeah. exactly what i'm not yeah. saying it is it's not What's that the, at all what is it What's the there's a name for there's it. Name for Just it. like right. I also have everyone I got another condition. When there's I, I I get very irritated with certain sounds and they're small sounds that nobody else might hear. David's shaking his head because bless mm -hmm. his heart. There's things <laughs> where I'm just like, I gotta go to the other room. Um, or if I'm trying to concentrate on something and there's like another small sound coming from somewhere, my I lose my mind. Um, there's names for all this, so everybody just Google it. Uh, but the thing with the jumping is, and being at, in a height situation, I'm not afraid of heights, but when I get in that situation, I'm like, ooh, ooh, I want to jump. My body has this urge. So I thought, 
let's jump out of a plane. I think this will help this. Um, I hated it. I loved it for the floating moment. Once the, the parachute, parachute goes yes, out, correct. but when you jump and you're free falling, ooh, mama, that's not like no. a thing I never ever need to do again. Like I'm good on it. And it was really, really cold up there. Very cold. That you weren't really expecting to get blasted with cold <laughs> air. Really cold. And did you feel like we received enough training information I mean, before we is there is there ever going to be enough well and fun sides side note of this not to be on a tangent about it right before we were waiting to get on the plane and they cleared oh, yeah. the field and we were yeah. like why are they clearing the field and they were like everybody has to leave everybody has to leave you have to go out to this waiting area so us and like everyone who was behind us we all go and kelly's there and her face is like white as a ghost and we're like what is wrong she was in an area where she can watch everybody land essentially and she goes i don't want to tell you guys and we were like what is the problem right now and she was like a guy just landed and it did not go well he's okay. not okay and we were like what and then but we were all in our gear and like ready to jump ambulance was driving out to like part of the field and they're pulling this guy who was like an instructor yes so Yeesh. he was so not playing things. tandem he was an instructor he's anyways i think Something bad happened to his leg. We won't get into details. But Laura, Sean, David, and myself, we were all geared up, ready to go. And we were like, well, we're jumping. So we waited for the ambulance to come get the fellow. And then we got on the plane and jumped. And I don't, I am glad I did it. I'm glad I can say that I, I've been skydiving, but I absolutely do not need to do it again. Nope. And your question mark, you might still. I don't know. I think I, I don't know. I think I'd do it at a lower because we were at 10,000. I think I'd do it at a different height I yeah know, i well i'm not gonna do it at a lower height but yeah yep. laura was like i think we did 10 usually it's five she was like she she had usually done five she was like that 10 really made a difference because like, really even she was like i don't know oh, that was terrifying <laughs> anyway so that's our story on skydiving let's jump right into the guest for this week ah, i see what you did there. yeah let's jump let's do it let's do it super excited to have jenna hamshaw vegan superstar and author of the vegan week meal prep recipes to feed your future self back on the pod this week yeah she's back back uh jenna is a registered dietitian nutritionist recipe developer and the author of food 52 vegan uh power plates uh she shares vegan recipes on her blog the full helping which she has written since 2009 yeah and that's two separate books so that's sorry food 52 vegan that's and, right. power plates. and power yeah plates. she's got like several books superstar she is she is well established in the cookbook world. She is a longtime vegan with a demanding schedule, prioritizes nutritional balance while not sacrificing taste in this roadmap to eating vegan food regularly. Even if you have only one hour to spare, this book will teach you how to batch cook varied, colorful and comforting meals over the weekend. Yeah. And you don't have to choose between the demands of your schedule and your desire to prioritize uh, taste, nutrition and the joy of eating, you know, homemade food. That's exactly right. She she makes it all work for you. And Jenna is a return friend of the pod. She was on episode 14 of Keep On Cooking, chatting about her fabulous book, Power Plates, which I also love. I'm I'm a very big, big, big Jenna fan. And we're so glad she came back to talk about her new book, The Vegan Week. Please welcome back to the podcast, Jenna Hamshaw. <laughs> She makes choosing tasty and nutritional food easy peasy for a dose of sunshine and positive good vibes. You can never go wrong checking out her blog and Instagram. Please welcome to the podcast, creator of The Full Helping, Jenna Hamshaw. Welcome. Hey, Dustin. I'm so hey. happy to be back on the podcast. Yes. Thank you for coming back. We didn't scare you away the first time. That's fantastic. No, this, is our, this is our second time around and it's it's lovely to return. So. I love it. Well, Thank let's uh, dive into your having me again. Yes, of course. Thrilled you're here. Can't wait to talk about this book. And we're going to start off with your icebreaker. Do you now or have you ever collected anything? I've never had like a substantial collection of anything and I didn't collect anything growing up. I, I guess you could say I have a micro collection, like a teeny tiny collection of wines that I really like. There you go. I think that's a great collection. That's and a good. small one is nice. It's yeah. like narrowed down. Well, I also live in a studio apartment, so there is only so much that's possible in here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Choices you have to make with that. <laughs> I collect uh, playbills and I've collected them. Oh, that's and a good one. Yeah, but I still true. can't like, even if I've seen the show numerous, like, it's very strange. Like if I've seen the show numerous times, I'm like, well, I still need to take the play ball home with me. Like this happened. I came here. I, I don't know what yeah. it is. You so are. like, Ooh, do you know what I just remember? I actually did have one as like a, 
I guess I was like a preteen that I just remembered. I had completely forgotten. Do you remember when people used to collect absolute ads? No. What are those? Absolute vodka ads. This was when, when I was growing up, it was like a whole thing that you would collect absolute vodka ads and people would like put them in like laminated like trapper keeper binders or like whatever was cool in the like early nineties when this was all happening. Um, and I don't, I think we were like too young to even like understand we were collecting like advertisements for spirits, right, but, right. but those ads were really cool and they would be really different. And there were some that were like really hard to find. And some people would like go running out trying to buy like the issue of the magazine that they knew like a rare one was in. Yeah, it was a whole thing. I, what made these ads special for Absolute? I don't remember I them. think that they, it was just, it was always just the bottle with okay. kind of like very cool theme Design or decoration or something. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I bet if we Googled it, I bet if we both got off and Googled this now, there are probably like articles about 90s kids who were doing yeah. this, like why it was like a whole. Sure. Like, subculture yeah. but it was just that it would be really cool really cool designs um and it was clever like whoever came up with that ad campaign was really clever they found like this way to make these ads feel like collectors items in and of themselves i mean that right there making that money also i just want to point out that both of your items involved collecting booze basically it's, it's 100 <laughs> Uh, I love that for you. I love that journey. Uh, well, Jenna is a registered dietitian, food blogger, recipe developer, and cookbook author. She's also a return guest of the pod, as we just mentioned. You can check out episode 14 of Keep On Cooking to get a more detailed look into Jenna's history and also hear about another book of hers that I love, Power Plates. I love this book, and we chat all about it. See if I can line it up in the screen there a little bit. There we go. Power yeah. Plates. And uh, we're here today to talk about the new book of yours that I also absolutely adore here. It's The Vegan Week. I love this book so much. Can you give the listeners a little summary of what The Vegan Week is about? Yeah, basically, this is supposed to be like an approachable real world um, roadmap for meal prep. So I think when people, I think when people hear meal prep, they have like a certain set of associations that comes into mind. We all probably do. Um, they might vary from person to person, but I know for me, you know, before I got really into meal prep myself, and I think still sometimes when I think about meal prep, I I imagine something that's like very perfectionisty. Like I sure. imagine those Instagram posts where it's like twenty three containers and they're all identical, and there's like, you know, like the the whatever like little components and yeah. they're all like really like everything's lined, lined up, up and like, like yeah right. Mm -hmm. right um and that's great and if you meal prep like that sure more power to you that's fantastic um but i think that meal prep can also be a lot gentler than that i think it can also be a lot more variable i think it can be more flexible and i wanted to sort of talk about my own journey getting into meal prep and why i did and also sort of how it's saved me when it comes to cooking. Yeah. But I wanted to do that in a way that would feel really approachable to people because I am not the person who has 21 identical containers of anything. You know, my space is too small, A, and I am not that put together, B. So that's kind of, that's kind of why this book came to be. I love that you talk about that in the beginning of the book, how like you should be sort of talking about the joys of cooking but you were like, I'm not the cookbook author for that. So I guess you said that a little bit. Expand on that a little bit, what you meant there. What joys of cooking? Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, everything in life is fluid and, and, and situational and probably cyclical. I will say that, like, when I first started writing my blog, which was a while ago now, it was 2009, I was just in this moment of really loving cooking. And I think that love affair lasted a good long time. Like, we had a good run where I just really... I enjoyed cooking, even though I was writing about it and developing recipes professionally at some point along the way, like I still really enjoyed it. It was something I would, I would have told you that it was something I did both for work and for pleasure and for fun. And that like, it was a way for me to de-stress and relax and that I really yeah. sort of found cooking fun. And I wouldn't say that it's like joyless now, but I would say it's it's pretty rare that I tap into that joyful mood with it these days. It's more something I do because like, I like to eat homemade food 
Yeah. I, I, I like to, I do like to create recipes that are delicious. Like I like the rewards of all of it. I like sure. the part where I sit down and I eat the delicious homemade food and I like having it in my fridge. I just don't quite enjoy the process of preparing it in the way that I used to. My, you know, I've, I'm now practicing full-time as a dietitian and um, the work is really demanding of me and I am just busier than I was yeah. or I'm busy in a different way is a better way of putting it um, than I was when I started writing about food. And I more sort of just need the food to be there, but I, right. I, I'm not quite into the process of preparing it. Um, meal prep has been the solution for me in the sense that if I can like carve out a chunk of time once a week to just get it done, doesn't mean I'm going to enjoy it, but, but it means it's going to happen. And then I'll have the food to enjoy as the week goes by. So I get to sort of uh, enjoy the fruits of my labor. And I have a sort of system that encourages me to actually get it done. Yeah. And I think it's great. You, you, Tell the readers here about your journey with that, as you were just explaining. And I, I heard someone at a teaching kitchen conference I went to, it was a chef stood up and they were like, we have to stop telling everyone that it's so easy. They were like, oh, it's, it's hard. Like, it's actually hard. And I thought about that more. I love that they said that because I was like, you're right. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, it's hard until it's not right. And then you find different flows with it. Like the more you do something, the easier it becomes. And like, maybe it's joyful in the beginning, but then also like for you, it turned into a moment where it's functional and also a business, you know, all these different things. So like it all sort of cooking holds a different place for everybody the common denominators that we all have to eat. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's the thing. Um, you know, I started, I started with meal prep when I was doing my clinical internship and I was just like, for the first time ever, I think I was, I think I liked cooking more then than I do now, but I think I just had no time for it. So yep. it was like, if I didn't make something over the weekend, it wasn't getting made. I was coming mm -hmm. home so late that year and my hours started so early you know, that it was, it was more than a nine to five. Yeah. And there was no way I was going to be cooking on weeknights. It had to happen over the weekend. Um, and then, and COVID happened. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, like pandemic time was this, like really the, this time of sort of like experimenting more and getting mm -hmm. creative in the kitchen and like really reconnecting with the joys of cooking. And it was just the opposite for me. I sure. I've never hated cooking more than I did in that year and a half of lockdown. Truly. I, I, and I did it for a little while. And then I just started like eating garden meatballs every night. Cause yeah. I, like, I can't anymore. I'm so yeah. dumb. I hate this. I was so resentful of being home. I, I love New York. I love being out and about. I, mm -hmm. I was so unhappy with that feeling of, it just being me in my apartment every day and cooking. Yeah. I think cooking felt connected to that sense of being sure. trapped and I just like maxed out on it. Um, yeah. But I, what I found was that then I really stopped cooking and I did really miss my homemade food. I missed yeah. the variety. I missed the nutrition of it. I missed that wholesome quality. I missed the reward of having a lot of delicious things in my fridge that mm -hmm. I've made myself. And so meal prep was the thing that I think allowed me to get, come back to cooking after yeah. all of that. And I think to this day, it's the thing that keeps me cooking. Um, yeah. Pun intended, given the title of your podcast. Right? <laughs> um, and I think what I realized is that like, whether I'm in one of those phases where cooking's fun for me or one of those phases where it just feels like a real drag, yeah. meal prep holds me accountable to just do it yep. either way. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I love that. And I, I love the subtitle of this book because you, you know, it's called the vegan week, but then recipes to feed your future self. And I feel that's sort of at the core of what this book is really about. And you found a great niche in being so thoughtful uh, on helping people with their food choices and pep talks and strategies and kindness. And we're going to dive in. You start this book off with a section covering making uh, make ahead cooking for your real life. How does that break down in this cookbook? This cookbook? How is make ahead cooking covered in here presented for people for real life application. I think the first way that comes to mind is um, I tried to give people some sort of planning system that would allow for a lot of flexibility. So, so just to back it up, like I think step number one for meal prep is like, you have to have some sort of plan in place. You need to actually get the ingredients you'll need. You need to know what you're going to make ahead of time. Right. Um, and 
that I think can vary in terms of how ambitious it is. So mm-hmm. when I'm doing my clinical internship, I literally had to make my breakfast, lunches, and dinners all ahead of time. There was nothing I was going to be able to get done as the week went by. And I did. I really made every single meal I was going to eat over the Which weekend. blows my mind that you yeah. did. Like that is a lot of work in addition to your daily grind, essentially. It, it was. And I mean, the other thing about the internship year is that when you become a dietitian, the internship year, not only is it unpaid, you, you actually pay a fee to do it. Oh and it's gosh. significant. So I was being especially budget conscious that year. Yeah. And I really, one solution as someone who lives in a city with lots of takeout options could have been that I just like got ate a lot of takeout that sure. year. I really didn't want to spend that money. So I really made everything ahead of time. I no longer meal prep like that anymore. You know, that was so extensive. Yeah. Um, but that was containers year, lined up probably next to each other. It was with as close yeah. as I've uh-huh. ever gotten to that. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But I'm now at a point where my dinners need to be made ahead of time. So yeah. sometimes breakfasts and lunches are either things I sort of throw together at the last minute or they're just really simple stuff. It's like I toast a bagel in the morning and, you know, put some mm-hmm. kind of cream cheese on it and move on with my day. Um, but my dinners still get made ahead of time. Any dinner yeah. I'm going to eat during the week has to get made ahead of time because I am not, I know myself well enough to know I'm not going to wrap up at 7 p.m. and start cooking. Um yeah. So I tried to make the book reflect that level of flexibility. Maybe you're someone who just needs one meal taken care of for the week ahead. You know, maybe you're the person who likes to have your lunch ready to go. If you have a busy job and you just, you know, want to have something ready for you. Maybe you're the person who prefers to make your dinners ahead of time. Maybe you're someone who can do a certain amount of cooking as the week goes by, but you just want to get some basics made. Like you want to cook some rice or a dressing or whatever, like one or two components that you'll be able to use in various ways. Mm -hmm. And so what I tried to do in the front matter of the book was just give people this, um, this flexibility and a sort of way of thinking about planning based on what their needs are. And that, that is where the real world component came in, just sort of like, I wanted to think about the fact that everyone has a different life and a different yeah. schedule and give them options for that. Yeah. And you do that because there's a, a couple really great points that you make. And it's it's really, it comes down to this. How much food do you need and how much time do you have to prepare it really? And when I think about that, I w- I've gone through different phases in my life with meal prepping too. And there was a phase where I was like, well, I have two hours on Sunday to do like a couple dinners and lunches. And then I'll put in like two hours on Wednesday or Thursday that right. give me two more for the rest of the week. And like, that was great for me at a time. It doesn't work necessarily for me right now, but there was a time when that really fit in. And now I'm, I'm good if I can get like, if I have like one meal that I can sort of plug in throughout the week, if I've just like created that bowl of whatever it is today, I've got like teriyaki tofu with rice and broccoli and mushrooms. You know what I mean? And I have a few of those yeah. to get me throughout the week. I can just grab. So it's like finding that place for you in your schedule. I love that. And the first chapter we start out with speaking of tofu, we start out with proteins, what are your couple go-to proteins in this book that you usually have on hand? Uh, there's a balsamic tempeh that I like a mm-hmm. whole lot. Uh, that's a big one. There is a taco meat that is chickpeas and walnuts. That was actually inspired by my photographer, Ashley. She sort of gave me the hot tip about making that one. Um, and I really like it. That one's that one's a good one. I like it a lot. And then um, for breakfast, especially like breakfasts that have a more savory component. There is like a, there's like an eggy square that's chickpea flour and mm-hmm. bake it in just like a square baking pan nice. and then cut it into smaller squares. And that can just go on a toasted English muffin and be a quick breakfast sandwich. I really like that. It can also be like, I can just kind of, you know, like sometimes you'll see like a grain bowl with like a fried egg on it and yep. it can be that too. Yep. It can be like mm-hmm. the vegan equivalent of that. It's well. nice. I love that stuff like that. Even like if you make a fried rice or something, you could crumble it up and right. toss it in there. But I think you have like a scramble variation. Of I it also in there have as well. a scramble yeah. variation. Yeah. So good. And I, and I, you know, I, I tend to, as a dietitian, I always say like, I never planned on being like the dietitian who was sort of on everyone's case about their protein intake, but that's a hundred percent what I've become. Sure. <laughs> I feel like very strongly about making sure everyone's getting their protein needs met. So I, that was the first chapter of the book intentionally because I wanted everyone, yeah. to, if nothing else, have a protein in their fridge that they can yeah. use as the week goes by. I think, you know, the bigger myth is how much protein everyone thinks they need now at this point. Everyone thinks they need so much protein. I feel like. 
Yeah, but I would offer the rejoinder to that, that there is like a, um, I think there is a happy medium. I do yeah. think there are plenty of people who have what they think they need is well in excess of what they do. But I also yeah. think there are a lot of people who don't realize that they're not eating enough. Sure. I, mean, I, I work with a lot of those folks. So yeah. I try to help them get their intake a little bit higher. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the perfect chapter to do that. I have my eyes on the tempeh chorizo. Oh, and, I like that one too. Yeah, oh, yeah. It looks, I love tempeh too. I just love tempeh and different ways to use it. And we've got uh, curried red lentils in here, a tofu feta, barbecue white beans, lentil, apple, sausage patties. So lots of options for everyone. The next chapter is vegetables and starches. And there are great offerings in here uh, that really dress up veggies and starches so that our future selves have something to look forward to. We got chipotle smashed sweet potatoes. Yes, please, yeah. to that. Uh, Sunday focaccia, skillet maple cornbread, smoky collard greens, and turmeric roasted cauliflower. What's something from this chapter uh, you think might be the most common ones to find in someone's meal prep? Um, That's a good question. I would, I really, I'll just tell you the one I really like to make. It's yeah. Green beans in this chapter. It's like green beans with tomatoes. Um, Delicious. Flipping to look at it. Yeah, that's in part, uh, it's based on sort of a traditional Greek recipe um, of, I think it's called, yeah, Fasolakia. I'm sure I just said that wrong. I'm a terrible half Greek person. But um, <laughs> those, it, it's just like long stewed green beans with tomatoes. And I grew okay. up with them. I think they're really delicious. That's the kind of thing like you could add, the, it could be like a side dish with pasta, mm -hmm. it could get mixed into pasta, yeah. plop it on a grain bowl. It can just be a side dish if you've got some other, like, you know, tofu, couscous, whatever. But yep. That's like a nice versatile one. I really like that. And um, you said long stewed so, green beans. Sorry, say that again. Long stewed green beans. Like yeah, like, just meaning they're cooked for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I thought. I love that because one of my holdups with green beans always, I love them, but I don't get to them enough because I'm kind of always like, well, what am I going to do with these? So I love having options for that. Right. Yeah. And I feel like I, you know, my default for a long time was just to like blanch them or steam them. So mm -hmm. they look crispy, but they actually get kind of like nice and sweet when you cook them for a while. Okay. So. All right. I love that about green beans. And I also love a good sauce. And we're, we're a saucy household here. We always have some homemade goodies on hand. The next chapter is sauces, spreads, dressings, and dips. I think I can see the harissa tahini vinaigrette and garlic and green sauce going into regular rotation in our home. But what are a couple that you use regularly from this chapter? The house dressing. Yeah, yes. I love that because it's like, it, I would say that's probably the dressing. Always in the house. Always in the house. Yeah. And it's funny because like it was one of those, I'm sure you know what this feels like. It was one of those recipes that I made and I was like, okay, so I'm borderline obsessed with this. I'm mm -hmm. not sure anyone else is mm -hmm. that much. Like I have no idea. Like, um, but I know that I love it. I know that my mom likes it so much that I make it every week for myself and I double the recipe and bring her yeah. a bit too because she really likes it. And I can't even tell you why we like it so much. The flavors are basically like I think there's Bragg's and nutritional yeast and apple cider vinegar and a little yep. bit of onion powder. I yep. don't know why I think it's so good, but I do. It sounds delicious. There's actually a dressing I make that is similar to that. And I took it into a place I was developing and again, obsessed with it. And everybody was like, yeah, it's good, but you're kind of like cuckoo for this. No, right. And I was like, I don't know what to tell yeah. you. I think it's amazing. It happens sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other ones that are staples in your fridge? There? I like the harissa tahini a whole mm. lot too. Um, and then I am trying to see. Yeah, it's, there's also a tricky so yogurt dip that I you can make it with. Yeah, you can make it with like store bought vegan yogurt, or you can make like a a cashew cream version of it. Um, I like that just because at a certain point there's only so much hummus I can eat, and I sure. want something that's similar but different. Yep. And then I would say. Um, some of the, an, a, another like really versatile one would be like the cheddar cheesy sauce, which is just like your standard issue vegan cheddar sauce, but it's the kind of thing it can go on potatoes yep. can, you know, it can do a whole lot of heavy lifting. In the yeah. Kitchen. The cheese sauce is so versatile. You have it around. I always have it when I'm looking at it in the fridge. I'm like, well, what? I, I make like so much of it. I'm like, I got to use that. I can put it on something. Like, you know, you want cheese sauce on something. Just Good like get to it have. together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just bake a potato and put it on there. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we have breakfast as the ne next chapter. And I love that all of these recipes have been designed so that they can transport easily in storage containers. Often breakfast gets overlooked during the week because people yeah. are in a hurry. And yeah. I have to try these 
freezer breakfast burritos, but what is a breakfast items you would, you would tell someone to make if they just picked up this book? Oh man. You know, I love the breakfast burritos too, but they are not the quickest. (laughs) Sure. Sure. They will be once they're frozen and you just have to pull it out of your freezer. But there's just a little more heavy lifting than there are with some of the other recipes, but I really like that one. Um, I like that one a lot. I like the frittata, the green Mm -hmm. onion and potato frittata. I would say that that is probably one of the recipes. There are like five or six recipes from the book that I still make constantly. Like I try to make all of them from time to time, but yeah. I would say that's one of the ones that I just make a lot and I vary the vegetables that are in it based on what I have sometimes or what's in season or whatever. I love that one. It's that with like a slice of toast or just some fruit is a really, really great recipe. And you know, it's a good one too. Everyone listening, if Jenna's going back to it, then that's the best when, when you write a book and then you're like, oh, let me just pull out my own book and make this recipe I've made 10 yeah. times, even though you know how to make it. You're like, I just want to, you know, it, it's, it's a proud moment too. Cause you're like, I love this recipe. I love it. So I'd love to hear you're going back to yeah. some of these in here already. I like that one a lot. There is also a orange date muffin. Yeah. Orange yes. muffins. And those I should make more often, but um, I haven't made them that many times since the book came out. But I do, I do love them. I think they're delicious, and they're just like a different flavor profile. That yeah. you know, I've made plenty of like blueberry muffins, but they were just when I first sort of made them, I was like, this is different and yummy. And yeah, yeah. I love, I love a little, a little pop of pecan in there with the orange. And speaking of blueberry, you've got the blueberry crumble cake in here, pumpkin waffles, hash brown breakfast casserole, which I'm always down for an overnight French toast with vanilla berry sauce. Can you tell us more about this uh, overnight French toast? Yeah, basically just the idea was like, you know, if you like French toast, if you like bread that has been soaked in deliciousness and then crisped up, which who doesn't, you know, um, but you don't have the time to like sit in front of your skillet on a weekday morning and like flip the bread and make it like slice by slice. Like it's just, it's time consuming. It is. Yeah. Um, So I kind of wanted to give some like a make ahead option for you to be able to make a big tray of something that if, if not quite the same as French toast, it's like very French toast. Like, yeah. How does it work then? Are we submerging it and setting it? Yeah. You pour like the like custard, Yep. over the bread slices you submerge them I put it in the fridge overnight so they soak it all up and then you just put it in the oven and they get crispy the center stays softer than the center of like normal sure. French toast but it still has like a lot of the same qualities and then the berry sauce is just a way of sweetening it and getting some of the extra nutrition in from the berries I love that I made a um any French toast that you can tackle like this I did like a casserole one earlier like six yeah. months ago and I had never done one and I when I did it I was just like why why have I been snoozing on this like this just makes so much more sense to have it all done instead of standing over the pan like you say like flipping it and you know trying to get the right temperature and not burn it or have it stick and all those things. right and I love French toast the traditional way but you know sure. that's like a that's like a Sunday Saturday thing for me not yeah. like a yeah. Tuesday morning kind of thing yeah and imagine if you have you know if you have family over or something how great to just put yeah. something in the oven and then be able to pull it out so it's great uh and I love a good snack the next chapter is snacks I especially like in the intro how you mentioned the pleasure you feel when you grab a homemade snack and throw it into your backpack and I think that's so true it does feel so much nicer when you can toss a snack in your bag knowing you took the time to make it and know exactly what's in it um I think that some of the times grabbing a snack for most of us is you know we think of convenient items that are probably likely not that great for us. What's uh, your favorite thing to snack on from this chapter? Well, I am, I am definitely a sweet snack person, not a savory snack person. I just, I think there's like, there are like toasted chickpeas in the chapter, but it's definitely, <laughs> it indicates my <laughs> preference for something sweet in the afternoon. And that's actually my favorite time for sweet. So I know sure. for some folks it's like dessert after dinner. And I, I'm not opposed to dessert that way, but I actually like, I really like to have something sweet in the afternoon with some tea or whatever when I'm taking a break. So I would say that the dark chocolate oat scones are my favorite thing in the chapter. Mm -hmm. They could be breakfast too. um, But I really love that recipe. I remember being like happy when it turned out it scones can be a little fussy. It was just easy to make and they're really good so those are my favorites um I really like the fig newtons or like they're not Mm -hmm. 
big cookies. Those are another one that I really like. I really liked big Newtons growing up and well, these- and you talk about, there's a trick about sort of achieving the cake, like texture in these cookies. Do you want to fill us in here? It's not my trick. It's Stella Parks's trick. The, she's a wonderful, uh, baker and she writes about baking in wonderful ways and has cookbooks of her own and she has written about sort of iconic American desserts um and what she recommends doing is after you slice the bars of the fig cookies into the individual pieces she recommends putting them in a closed container Mm -hmm. so like normally with any baked good you're supposed to leave everything open until it's totally cool so that it doesn't get soggy lose its crispness or whatever but with these it's actually the opposite you want right. them to, you don't want them to be crispy crunchy so you're you steaming it a little there. when you put the we're literally steaming yeah. it yeah um and i i tried it being like oh i wonder and yeah. it really works it really works oh i love that and I, I i love that you have this recipe in here as a kid i didn't really like love fig newtons and as i've gotten older i've, I've oh, i loved them they're yeah they when i got older they became delightful to me i was like yeah. oh well this it feels like an adult sort of cookie too i'm like how great is that uh well you've got some other great items in here some hummus pinwheels love a good pinwheel like and, those uh, a lot yep yeah yeah and you have these um crispy ranch chickpeas you spoke of so it's funny you said you're a sweet snack person I can't, I'm sweet and savory. I'm all over the place. So like, I just, I love snacks, but so equal these opportunity snacker. Uh, yes, equal opportunity snacker. And these crispy ranch chickpeas immediately when I saw these, and this just tells you about me maybe, but I'm like, I'm sneaking these into the movie theater. Like these yeah. are going to be a movie theater yeah. snack and I'm here for it. Cause we all need healthy snacks. And when we go to the movies, saves your wallet and your health, you know, uh, and bowls and lunch boxes is the next chapter. I'm obsessed with lunchbox being called out here for the title of this because I just I want to like I work from home now for the most part unless I'm traveling. But if I'm I wish I was going somewhere where I could have a lunchbox every day because I love it. Yeah. And of course, there's different recipes in this book uh, that make the perfect lunchbox. And you give some pointers on containers to buy as well for bowls. Do you find you gravi- gravitate towards a certain recipe in this chapter for the perfect bowl for your taste? For the bowls, for my taste, I think it's sort of a lunch first. There are some lunchy ones and then some dinnery ones in my mind. So yeah, what um, makes that differentiate di- differentiation? Is it's that the word? What differentiates that for you? It's there we go. Very and stupid. I don't think there are any rules. <laughs> it's like it. There's no. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, the Cajun red bean bowls are the ones that I make the most often for dinners. Mm. No doubt. The, I've made them the most times since Love I wrote that. the book, but I also really like the chickpea piccata bowls for something in the evening yeah. for like dinner. And then um, one of the ones that I have made a lot for lunch would be the farro uh, and the farro and the balsamic tempeh and pickled vegetable bowl. It's on page the page. beet and pickled vegetables. It's yeah. so vibrant in color. It's beautiful. I really like that. Um, yeah, I like it. I like I like all the things in there. And I also just like how the pickled vegetables add like a little pop of acidity and freshness yeah. and you can vary them based on what veggies you have. And the texture, a little crunch yeah. sometimes too. Oh. I went right to the taco bowl, of course. Just I like that one a lot too. Yeah. It also has that chickpea walnut meat, which I'm fascinated by. I love that because for a long time, it's just been walnut meat. Now we're adding some chickpeas in there. So I think that's a very nice touch to that. And uh, the peanut tempeh bowls with coconut rice are in here. Tangy cashew lime noodle bowls, turmeric roasted cauliflower and brown basmati rolls, the tar roasted carrot and tabbouleh bowls. So many great things to choose from satiate you here and fill you up with nutrients as well and we heat things up a little with the stovetop chapter featuring pepper steak soy curls white bean fennel soup mixed potato quinoa stew vegan fried rice one pot pasta with olives and capers which is right up my alley i love the saltiness from those items and what about okay so the seitan the seitan goulash i have to ask you about this what's your history with goulash before you put it in this book nothing I, I would love to like, I would love to say that there's some like family connection or whatever, but no, I was actually, I think I had an idea of what it was in my mind and I had definitely eaten things labeled as such and been like, this is yummy. But I remember having to Google it to make sure I was actually like correct about what goulash is. And of course there's no like single recipe, right? Like there sure. are different variations and, and different ways of preparing it, but I definitely had to do a little research so that well, I, I was talking about the correct thing. Then I have to ask you, I dug a little on it, but have you ever seen it with pasta? Uh-huh. Yeah. Totally. 
incredible. Okay, because so when I saw this, I was like, and then I saw it with potatoes, and I was like, I gotta text my my mom made goulash all the time when we were kids, and I was like, but then when I looked it up, it all said potatoes, so no, I was like, potatoes no, seems like the way. Definitely a version with pasta, a hundred percent. Okay, all right, yeah. and then I was like, maybe this was just something that happened in my family with my mom no. when she was. She said that her mom made it all the time because I asked her. I said, hey, what's goulash? When did this come in? Because you yeah. made it for us as kids. She was like, well, my mom made it all the time. It was super cheap to make. She's like, I love goulash. I was like, yeah, I know no, you did. it's delicious. I I thought about the pasta version, but the truth is I eat so much pasta anyway. And there are other sure. pasta recipes in the book. I was like, I should probably mix it up a little bit and do potatoes. I got to tell you, I don't love the pasta version. So I, but I like the idea of goulash. So I really want to try this potato version I'm yeah. here for. I mean, of course I love my mom. It's, you know, it's my mom's goulash. So I'm not, I'm not complaining about it, but I was, I was more intrigued by the, I was like, Ooh, potatoes. I want to try it yeah. like that. So I'm very stoked to try it. What's one of your favorite go-to stovetop meals in this chapter? The one pot pasta. Pasta. That's uh, another one of the ones from the book that I've made the most often since. I just love a one pot pasta so much. It's per I mean, for me, it's perfect. I love it so much. Um, I really like the fried rice too. It's the first vegan fried rice I've made for myself that I was like, I really loved. I've made yeah. other versions and I've made them with different like eggy things and like different, different ways of approaching the recipe. And this was the first time I was like, yeah, like slam dunk. Yeah, I love this. I will make this many times. I love this recipe. So oh, that's so really good. That one. That's so good. And and from the stove top, we go to the oven. This is the oven meals chapter. Tell us about the bigger is better vegetable lasagna. That's definitely my favorite in the chapter. I can tell you what that. makes it bigger and better. It's so like I think I've made a lot of vegan lasagnas that are like very heavy on the veg component. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, so I've made like a lot of ones with zucchini in them or eggplant or whatever. Um, but I wanted this one to be a little more traditional. I wanted it to be more like cheese forward. So there's sure. a lot of tofu, cashew, ricotta involved, like a heavy amount delicious. of the vegan cheese. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, it's big in size. It can serve 10 people depending on what else it's served with. It can yeah. also serve fewer, but like it, it can, it can serve a crowd. Um, I had, I had. I had just seen Samin Nosrat's, I, Nosrat, I think I just mispronounced her name, um, but I hope I didn't. I had seen her Bigger is Better lasagna in, in the New York Times, um, and I had been just sort of inspired by the idea of just like something big and sumptuous. And yeah. like, you know, in, in a meal prep book, I think there was the danger for me when I was thinking about writing this book um, about trying to make everything like super quick, easy, because mm -hmm. the assumption would be if you have limited enough time that you want to meal prep in the first place, you probably want everything to be very streamlined and easy to make. Sure. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, even if you have a busy schedule and you're meal prepping, you might once in a while want to make one of those like big sort of showstopper things. Yeah. You know? And this was that's that's like the spirit that inspired this lasagna. I wanted it to be big. The goal was not for like a quick, easy recipe, but the goal was essentially to be like, if you have enough time on the weekend to make this, you can then enjoy it on your busy weeknights and it will still feel like something sort of big and celebrated. Yeah, hearty and satiating. I yeah. love too the idea of, you know, I just, I, there's a lasagna. I haven't put it in any of my books yet. I, I love it. I've been making it for years. I need to at some point, but it's, um, I just make it for literally all, whenever I have non-vegans that I have to feed as a group, I'm like, the, the lasagna is going to do it. Like they're going to be happy. You know, it's got yeah. pasta and all the things sauce. So they're usually so happy from it. So yeah. great things to uh, feed the crowd and uh, other great stuff near stuff, sweet potatoes with coconut greens. I love those. Yeah. Oh, sounds so good. And soy curl fajitas, sheet pan nachos, always a fan of those <laughs> orzo stuffed tomatoes. And what is another one? So we're thinking about, you know, something that we could serve family and friends with. I know it's a meal prep book, but I feel like in this chapter, there might be another one in addition to the lasagna, something you can serve family and friends, they'd be excited. Or maybe you're taking your friend a little meal prep variation of it at lunch. What is something that you could serve to family and friends from this chapter? Another one. I'll tell you what I've made for my mom. Um, I yes. made her the creamy quinoa artichoke casserole. I really oh. like that one too. And then the orzo stuffed tomatoes, like I said, Delicious. I'm and so we both love orzo. We both love tomatoes. Um, and yeah, those are just two that are dear to my heart because I think they feel really aligned with like yeah. the flavors I grew up with and my, like my culture. 
I love it. And I, I love the use of orzo. I don't use it enough. I don't use it enough. That and green beans. You're inspiring me today. And now I've got recipes at my fingertips to try. So it's great. And now, and now, and now comes my favorite part. This is the desserts chapter. Always my favorite part. Featuring beauties like mini apple galettes, ginger pear upside down cake, key lime pie crumble cups, and can you tell us please more about these salted tahini date caramel cups? I really like those a lot. Oh, yeah. just the title. Come on. Totally. I mean, listen, I have yet to meet a peanut butter cup that I did not love, but the idea here was just something a little bit different. And um, I've always, obviously dates have that caramel like flavor and yeah. I've always liked salty sweet combinations in desserts. And so the idea was to just do like the tahini for creaminess the dates for like a caramel sweetness um, and then sea salt. And so it's like savory, sweet, bitter. The chocolate is also like a little bit bitter, a little bit sweet. It was just the idea was all of those flavors combined. And then just like an alternative to the traditional nut butter stuffed mm -hmm. um, like chocolate. Mm. chocolate cup. Yeah. So good. So good. I, really I love, love it. it. I was happy. I, I, I loved developing the recipes in this chapter because power plates, though I love it, has no desserts. And, so, <laughs> and that made me very sad. As yeah. Like sweet things. And so after power plates, I knew that whatever I wrote next would Had have, have after and that I yep. would really into it. Yeah. The time has come. The sweets are here. Well, and you, you have a sweet tooth as you've mentioned. So what, uh, what else from this chapter, uh, jumps out for you? Um, I really like, there's a carrot cake in there that's based mm. on a, a two layer carrot cake that I have on my blog, but it, the idea was just for it to be a little simpler. And more yeah. Straight, so it's more of like a, more of a snack cake, if you will. I really, really love that one. There's another cake in there, which is not straightforward to make. It's the root vegetable chocolate cake. Um, I saw, I thought that sounded interesting. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm sort of, I like maybe to a fault, I'm a dessert traditionalist. So like, I very rarely use like, I, not a lot of my desserts have like vegetables sure. that I sneak in or, and I don't even really like bake with alternative flowers at all. Yeah. Um, I really like just classic desserts and I, I'm the same. I'm and the same. my dessert recipes are always that way. But this one, I actually like, you've probably seen Genevieve Co has this like chocolate sweet potato frosting. I haven't seen it, but that sounds delicious. And it's like a two ingredient recipe. It's great. I was really inspired by it when I first read about it and thought it was really, really smart. Um, so I thought about using that. And then I have a chocolate beet cake on my blog that I actually, um, I, I, I developed some time ago and I really love it. In that case, I feel like the beets aren't just there for the sake of having a vegetable there. They really make the cake better sure. and like, they, they make it more moist. They give it a particular kind of sweetness. So the idea was just to bring those two things together. And I, I, I had to test this one a lot. So I think I'm proud of it just because it finally turned out the way I wanted yes. it to. But I, I really like both of those. Um, and then the brownies I'm proud of. That's another one that I like worked I mean, really I hard to try to get yeah. it right. And they turned out well, I thought. So. Always good to have a good brownie in there and definitely worth being proud of because brownies, brownies, once the recipe's right, then great, we're good to go. But so easily it can go astray and you're like, oh, I wanted this little part to be this and that. And then it's like back to the drawing board. They are not one of the desserts that is easy without eggs. Yes. I will yep. say that. So yes, very true. Very true. Wow. Well, that brings us to the end of the book. Overall, what's a sort of book brag for you with this? What's something about the book you're most proud of? Um, that's a good question. It's a hard question to answer because this was actually a hard book to write. Like Power Plates, I remember was, it's not that I didn't work hard, but it's a book that kind of flowed from sure. the to finish. Like it was just the creative process felt very sort of like juicy and mm -hmm it all kind of worked. Um, this was a really hard book to write. I was late on my deadline. I, I, I started writing it just as lockdown started and it was, Ugh. it was, a, it was a messy creative process. That right there already. I'm just like, that's the, I was finishing my last one as it started and I was in that home stretch of kind of putting, so I, I feel you on that. It's just, it was a weird space to be in, to be creative in that moment. It was, it was, um, 
And I didn't do my best at keeping up with like any of my own deadlines or even, you know, I think I was hard to collaborate with my, my poor photographer, Ashley really had to end ultimately. Oh. Yeah. She had to sort of like rearrange a lot of the schedules she had been counting on because I was behind on everything. And she did very kindly, but I felt bad of course, because it's also her professional schedule that got sure, by sure. my fits and starts with everything. So it was just, it was tough. I think the thing that I'm proud of now, like my brag would just be like, I hung in there and I got it done and it, it I got it done. Like not elegantly at all, but there was a certain amount of just kind of like persistence and willingness to see it through that I had to call on to finish it. Um, and I will tell you that when, when the book showed up and I flipped through it, I was like, wow, it's actually beautiful. And I think these recipes are not awful. And like, I had truly felt like they were all going to be awful and that it was never going to happen at one point in there. And so just the fact that I finished it and that it's yeah. is good. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic book brag and something to be so proud about. You know, books, uh, it's you, you get the deal, you start working it out, and then suddenly you're actually doing it and you're you know it's it's life is different for everyone during those times you say yes to big projects and suddenly you're dealing with all these different elements and in your case a pandemic right it's just it affects everybody you know yeah and i i think there's like some amount of mystery as to why you go through phases where creative work comes easily mm. to you and you go through phases where it just doesn't and i yeah. it's not always what you think you know like when i wrote right. plates i was still working my way through grad school so i was a full-time student. I was, you know, writing my blog up in the wee hours. Yeah. Like, yeah. Student. Like, like my, it's not like everything was so straightforward that it should have been any easier to do creative work. Um, but for whatever reason, I was just like in a phase of my life where I, it flowed very easily. Whereas with the pandemic, you know, in some ways I actually had way more time on my hands than I sure. had in a long time, but sure. like, I was just so blocked. Yeah. You know, exactly. I mean, of course, there was also like mental health stuff. There was yeah. all anxiety and trauma. And, you know, I have depression and it flared up during lockdown pretty, yeah. pretty understandably. So there was all of that. But there is like a real mystery to creative work. And I, I you I don't think you always know why the muse is generous. Yeah. Sometimes and not generous other times. I love hearing you say that though, because I'm like, I'm just feeling seen a little bit because I've never really thought of it that way. And there are times when I'm like, why was this so easy, you know, at this certain time? And now this is such a struggle. And why are things coming so easily now? And other times I can barely like, you know, jot a few ideas down, like what's happening. So well, and isn't alone. it like cooking itself too? Like, why is it that there are some Saturdays where I can make like eight recipes in a day and I'm like, fine, I'm not stressed. I'm just like getting yep. it. Done. And then there's like a day where I don't want to like whisk together a vinaigrette and yes. I'm like, I cannot, yes. I don't want to get up. I don't want to open like, you know, a single jar. Like there are just, I, there are days where I'm like, I cannot chop an onion and it's, yeah why? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I think it's also that side of it, which we touched on a little bit before, but like when food turns into work, right? Like we both enjoy it, but there is a side of it where you're like, oh, there's a deadline. There's like actual, like I need to make eight recipes today, this Saturday, you know? So like it puts a different spin on us, but Hey, we'll go with the book brag. You showed up and you got the darn thing done, which is amazing. So I congratulate you on that. And, and the fruits of your labor, we're all so grateful for, we get to benefit from it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. And we will move on to your rapid fire question. We'll have a little fun right, here. Okay. I'll try yes. Not to get, I'll try not to get, you know, too, too nervous about any of this and I'll do my best. It's easy breezy, whatever you want it to be. Uh, if we want to, you know, if I get to one and, and you want to, if it's your favorite shape of pasta and you really want to think about that and chat about it back and forth, we can chat about all the different types of pasta. I'm fine with it. I, be as, I mean, that is, that is a topic I can cover. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And your first question is what's your favorite pasta shape? Love it. Um, <laughs> it is a tough one for me to answer. I can't afford <laughs> pasta. I will tell you this: when I moved apartment, I moved apartments after COVID, and I realized, like much to my shame, I think I really hoarded pasta during COVID. Like I like hoarded. I mean, I uncovered boxes. So I live alone. I uncovered like so many boxes. It was it was a little troubling. Like I, I have in my I, cupboard. As you're saying that right now, I'm like, oh goodness. Yeah. So yeah. Much. Um, I think orecchiette 
would be my number one. Okay. I just love All them. Right. Like the little, the little yep. hats, but oh, yeah, yeah. the shapes that I adore. Do you, did you find there was a shape in your pasta hoarding? Did you find, did you come across a shape that you had in back stock the most of? Uh, oh, good question. Um, I had a lot of rigatoni. There you go. Yeah. I had a lot of rigatoni. Yeah. And it's funny because it's not even the one I reach for most often, but that might be why. I Maybe that's, why. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, all right. Do you have a favorite meal prep container? Ooh. And I mean like a favorite, of course you can give a general favorite, but I'm wondering if you have one that's like, I don't know that you see it and you're like, oh, I'm glad my meal's in that one today. I don't know. That might be a weird question, but I have like a couple I really like. No, it's not a weird question. I think for like basic lunchy stuff, like if I just pack a sandwich or whatever, I have a little lunch box, aluminum okay. one, stainless steel, whatever it is. I really like that one for sandwiches and whatever I pack with my sandwich. Um, I think for bowls, I have one that always gets me excited because I think it's lovely to look at. And it's also generous in size, which is really important. Um, yep. I have the WP Porter Bowl. And okay. it is very, very pretty aesthetic. It has this like cool band that you strap on top to secure it. And it's just like a big, generous size. So I can pack one of my big old, sal like the taco salad from, yep. from the Vegan Week you know, I can like really load it up and it's not, it's, it doesn't feel skimpy. It feels yeah. generous. It's like important. That. You want that. You want that. Yeah. Want and they that. are pretty too. They're aesthetic. So I enjoy yeah, that. Right. So enjoyable to look at while you're eating out of, I love it. Uh, who is the person you text the most? Oh, my mom. That's easy. Great. Yeah, Great. Mom. And what is your most used emoji? Oh, the heart. Definitely the heart. Nice. Uh, pancakes or waffles? Waffles. How often do you floss? Daily. There you go. I didn't, you know, I, I, I finally started like five years ago every day. You know, it was that thing where the dentist yells and you're like, but I am every day. I don't know how much more I can floss. I like, no, no, I won't pretend that I always floss daily, but yeah. then I, it, I think it's just a combination of getting a little bit older and smarter about totally. taking totally. care of yourself and also realizing that like there is a connection to cardiac health and all sorts of things like flossing things. for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And also, you know, the more you don't floss, the higher that dental bill is going to be y'all. So That's get that it. daily flossing on. They mean it when they say it. Uh, do you have a favorite board game? No, I don't like board games very much. Ah, okay. And would you ever appear on a reality show? I don't not think so much so. not so no. much I felt after the board game answer I was like I feel like I know the answer to this but we'll see I think you... I'm a little, I think I, I I I definitely love connecting with people um and I can be outgoing but I think I'm just too private and it's, too shy it's a lot reality shows are a lot uh do you believe in ghosts I don't think I believe in ghosts literally sure um I think that there is a spiritual world that surrounds us. And I don't entirely understand what I mean by that or what I, what shape I think it takes, but I think it exists. And I think that I'm there could be some sort of spiritual connection to beings that have exited yeah. this life as we know them and they're still around us. Yeah. But not, I think probably in like a very, you know, in a more like literal straightforward way, I think the answer is probably no. Yeah, no, you're not seeing white sheets across the room is what you're saying. Yeah, I think I agree with you on on the expansion of that, though. Uh, favorite seasoning to cook with? Mm -hmm. Nutritional yeast. Very good. Do you think you would make a good detective? Yeah. Great, great. All yeah. right. I'm a healthcare provider. We have oh, you're a detective all the time. And you're a diagnostician in any capacity. I'm not, granted, I'm not a doctor, but dietitians do some diagnostician work. Oh, yeah. And you yeah, got to figure yeah. out and read through the lines often, I believe. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what was your last impulse buy? Mm. What was my last impulse buy? Flowers for myself. Very good. You wrote Very about good. on my blog. Yeah, I bought flowers for myself. I love that. I almost did that like two days ago. And then I was traveling and I was like, I'm going to travel. So I was like, well, I don't want to get them when like, I won't be home to enjoy them then. But maybe I'll I'll send them home to my husband. Maybe I'll, I'll send something. But <laughs> then I'm like, well, they're kind of for me too, because I get to see them. Anyway, uh, what is your must-have tool in the kitchen? Uh, 
aside, I mean, do you mean like a knife and a cutting board or do you mean like something a little more offbeat? Let's go offbeat. Yeah, I have a mandolin slicer that I use a lot. Yeah. Have you ever cut your finger? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I used to have this huge mandolin, cut my finger on it way too many times, got myself the tiniest one with a little handle. I love it so much now. It's perfect. Well, and so the, I should I should qualify that. The one I have is not a traditional mandolin, like with the V shape mm -hmm. and like you can do the julienne. It's it's more just sort of like a slicer. It's, yeah. Uh, and it's and it it just like slices. a little handle and you hold it. Has it has a little handle. I love it. Metal. Yeah. And that I find all I mean this is the silliest reason, but I just really like sliced cucumbers on a lot of things. I like them on hummus toast. I like them on bagels. And yes. so just for the cucumber. So yeah. easy. So easy. I love it on a cucumber. I'd say probably a cucumber is what I use it the most on. And I yeah, think we can, you're calling it a slice. I, I'm good with slicer or mandolin that because that blade is sharp. So it's fallen in that mandolin category for me. Yeah. You still got to be careful when you get down there. Well, you did it. That was your rapid fire. Good job. Good. I <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat today. Please tell everyone where they can find you online and on social media. So you can, my website is thefullhelping.com. That's my recipe blog. Uh, on social media, I'm very easy. I'm the full helping on every channel. Um, and so Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest. Uh, my nutrition website is thefullhelpingnutrition.com. Oh, so perfect. For my RD services. Yeah. That's great. Oh, I love it. Well, everyone go get your copy of, let's see if I can get it in the screen. Everything feels backwards doing video listeners. If you're watching, do we have it in there, Jenna? It feels yep, like I it see there. it. Like, All right. There. Uh, there. Go get your copy of the vegan week meal prep recipes to feed your future self. I promise you that you and your future self will not be sorry. It's available everywhere. Books are sold. And Jenna, you're a bright light and we're so lucky to have you nurturing our minds and bellies in the food world. Thank you for another fabulous book and taking the time to chat with me today about it. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, so nice. Thank you for wanting me back on the show and being generous enough to care about this book and for the sweet chat, Dustin. I appreciate it. This has been a Muzzy Cat production. <laughs>